Dr. Burton says that feelings of certainty can be so powerful that we'll ignore any evidence to the contrary. He cites people suffering from a neurological pathology to demonstrate just how strong and wrong a feeling of certainty can be. A good example would be taking a patient who developed an encephalitis and she had the very firm belief that she was dead and yet it was obvious that she was alive. And so I remember asking her, well, if you think you're dead, take your pulse. And she took her pulse and she had a pulse. And so I said, well, what can you conclude from that? She said, well, I'll have to conclude that dead people have a pulse. And I said, well, you know that's not so. And she said, yes, I know, but my feeling that I am dead is stronger than any other feeling that I have presently, and I believe it to be true. And what you realized was that there was something that overcame her that was gave her a stronger sense of belief in something that she knew to be wrong. In the past, people have referred to this as cognitive dissonance. You hold an opinion that goes against something else you know to be true, against overwhelming contrary evidence. And I think for the last 50 years, it's always thought to be on some personal or social or psychological basis. And now it's pretty obvious that it can occur under a variety of conditions that really are pretty organic or neurologically based, such as this woman I've told you about. And all of that really gave me, uh, finally, the conclusion that we do have a separate mental mechanism, call it a feeling state, that colors the thoughts, feels like a thought, but isn't a thought, and it gives us a sense of conviction. So this feeling of knowing is the linchpin of what creates moral decisions from being open-ended, I think this is right, but I can understand alternative opinions versus this is the way it should be. And I find that bothersome personally. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, are you suggesting we can't have moral certainty about anything, that anything goes, that moral certainty in itself is an impossibility? And what are the implications of that then? Well, the implications of a less than complete moral certainty is that you would have, hopefully greater acceptance of other moral viewpoints, then you're in a situation where you could say, okay, if we all have different moral viewpoints, is there a way that we can work out our differences? Sometimes there can't be. And my innate pessimism about this is that it may be that we each have to go our own way. On the other hand, if there's any hope for civilization improving, it will be that just understanding that we have these irreconcilable differences might lead to a better degree of tolerance and humility, less anger, less frustration, and perhaps the world wouldn't be so incendiary. According to neurologist Robert Burton, our moral positions are informed by personal history, environmental factors, and decisions that arise out of our personal biology. Our moral views are, at best, partially true. He argues that awareness of this might make us more tolerant of those who hold opposing views. I think people have to understand that morality is really not something that is an absolute for which you can say there's good and evil or there's an axis of evil. Evil automatically implies that that behavior, that person has no justification and it does not take into account other vantage points of other people. But at the same time, Robert... Aren't there things where you have to say, no, this is wrong. This is, this is evil, actually. I can't imagine you're arguing, you know, you should sort of see the Nazis' point of view, too. They have their own moral framework. Well, that's right. So in this, I, I, I do think that there are relative absolutes if there's – that's a, a, a non-meaningful statement. But it's pretty clear that the Ten Commandments exist in a way because there are some higher moral standards that we would like human beings to ascribe to. Now, let's take Hitler, for example. And I've never thought about this before. This may be dead wrong. From his point of view, he's actually a, a eugenicist. He's trying to make a perfect race and all the rest of it. On the other hand, there are what we call some moral imperatives that seem to exist above and beyond the individual vantage point. And for me, these take precedence over the individual vantage point. And I guess what it amounts to is that you have to have a strong sense of morality. Thou shalt not kill. Hitler is, is evil. At the same time as you can acknowledge that this would be 
from his point of view, a justifiable position. In other words, it allows you to understand it. It doesn't allow you to justify it. And I sort of waffle because obviously I believe in a higher morality that we should ascribe to, but I realize it's generated by my brain and my thoughts. And that leads into a fundamental paradox that I don't know how to resolve, and I don't think I'm smart enough for that. And what's that fundamental paradox? Fundamental paradox is that everybody's entitled to their position, but some moral positions are better than others. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it, people would more or less accept that if you were talking about scientific truth. Oh, sure. No one would think that they knew every scientific truth that there is. But when it comes to morality, people's reaction is very different. Susan Demick is a professor of moral philosophy at York University in Toronto. People do think they know moral truths, and it's important that they think that. It's important that we actually have moral convictions. A society of people who lacked moral convictions would be one that would incline to a very dangerous form of moral relativism or moral subjectivism, whereby we would treat morality like we treat beauty. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Morality would be in the, the eye of the beholder. Whatever you think is right is right, and whatever I think is right is right. And we might disagree, but we can disagree about morality just as we can disagree about judgments of beauty. That would be a disaster for the human race if we actually believed that. Now, luckily, we don't believe that, and we never live as if we believe that. We use moral criticism of others. We make moral judgments about other individuals and other societies all the time. That suggests that we're not actually moral relativists. So we can't live moral relativism, and moreover, we shouldn't, because we need that set of common expectations that morality gives us. Left to ourselves, we, we can be very dangerous. That, that is the individual, because who corrects us? Who gives us a broader, broader perspective on things? Michael Mulhall is a theologian and Catholic priest living in Chicago. Yes, there's a sense in which you have to own your own morality, but I would say you have to plug into the best source you possibly can. Who are the, the people that inspire you, that, that move the discussion forward? Let's have no illusions that we've arrived at some perfect church because we're, we're human. We may say that you know, the doctrines we hold are revealed, the God that we believe in is real. But we are not real. That is to say, we're not fully there. And so all our institutions are damaged by us because we're in them. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't have any better way of doing this. So we can look out there and say we should go into moral autonomy. Everybody has to decide from himself. In the book of Samuel, it's talking about the judges in Israel. And it says wisdom was uncertain. Uh, the, the word of God fell to the ground, and everybody did what they thought best. And that was not a compliment. That was a sense of this is how bad things had gotten. When everybody has to decide for themselves what they ought to do, society, the world, is not in a very good state. A society where everyone did as they pleased would be intolerable. But let's get real. We do have a society where it seems it's okay for some people to do exactly as they please. In theory, all of us should observe the rules, principles, and values that allow us to realize a good life and to live together cooperatively and peacefully. But as Bob Dylan sharply observed, the masters make the rules for the wise men and the fools. And as his hero, folk legend Woody Guthrie sang, now, as through this world I ramble, I've seen lots of funny men. Some will rob you with a six-gun, some with a fountain pen. It seems our society is based on two sets of morality, one for ordinary folks and the other for the rich and powerful. Friedrich Nietzsche certainly believed that to be true. He was a German philosopher who lived in the 19th century. He felt that the conventional morality of his time with its roots in Christianity, created a slave morality. 
the masses were to be meek and mild and willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of others. On the other hand, there was the master morality. The capacity to be cruel, aggressive, and deceptive was necessary for those wanting to rule and lead the herd. For Nietzsche, it was all about power. Quote, All things are subject to interpretation. Whichever interpretation prevails at a given time is a function of power and not truth. He proclaimed, God is dead. In other words, there is no source of absolute morality. He saw his task as setting people free from their enslavement to conventional morality. Individuals who had the courage to break loose would discover the true source of morality within themselves. Willem Zwart is a teacher at the Oak Grove School in Ojai, California. Its approach to education is based on the teachings of J. Krishnamurti. Born in 1896 in a small village in India, Krishnamurti spent most of his adult life traveling the globe and speaking on the need for humanity to undergo a radical change in consciousness. He died in 1986. His talks attracted people from all walks of life, from spiritual seekers to educators to scientists. The core of his teaching was simple and direct. Truth is a pathless land. Krishnamurti encouraged people to be a light to oneself. And in that sense, too, you find some similarity with what Nietzsche was saying. Krishnamurti said, deny all authority, all outward authority, the authority of priests, of the state, of religions, of guru, of the family, but also the authority ultimately of the self, of you yourself, of your own thoughts. But this is not about a sense of personal enlightenment. Uh, It has nothing to do with that. He is centrally interested in how do you change the world at large. And he says to deeply do that in a lasting and a sustainable way, we need to start with ourselves. For Krishnamurti, the only true moral action is to become aware of our conditioning. Because any other action, he would say, comes from that conditioning And it is this conditioning that has brought about a world of violence 